Okay, I assume you can see my slides okay? Yes. All right, well, thank you everyone. Thanks, Jay, for the uh, invitation and the introduction. Um, as, as he said, my name is Jeff Kale. I like to say it's uh, pronounced like the vegetable, but spelled differently. So I'm the VP of engineering for CPU development at ARM Incorporated. I'm based here in Austin. And it's my privilege to spend the first 15 minutes of this session trying to give everybody a primer on what a microprocessor is. I'm gonna start out really slow and, and like an old microprocessor to a modern microprocessor, I'm gonna get faster and faster and cover a lot of complex stuff uh, late and very quickly. I apologize for those of you who are experts, some of this will be very mundane. And for those of you who aren't experts, it'll get going pretty quickly. So apologize if you get lost somewhere in between, but you don't need to uh, retain all of this to, to, to get an understanding of, of uh, what we're talking about here. So let me start out, you know, when, when we ask people what a microprocessor is, most people think it's a computer, but it's a lot more than that. And fortunately, Thomas Watson was wrong when he said, I think there's a world market for maybe about five computers. So computers are, or, or microprocessors are more than just a computer. They're everywhere. You might hear them referred to as a processor, a CPU or central processing unit, microcontroller, or just a core. And they're all around you. And you saw some of the answers uh, in the chat uh, about how many people actually have or think they have. And you know, it's estimated that the average middle-class household has about 50 microprocessors in it, whether that's your laptop, your smartphone, the, the Wi-Fi and the modem that you're connected to this call in, the data center servers uh, that, that's, that's hosting and, and um, uh, storing our data, uh, uh, game machines, smart appliances, your car has dozens of microprocessors. You might have a wearable, a smart speaker, a printer, you know, home, smart home gadgets. But, you know, basically microprocessors are everywhere from, you know, your coffee machine uh, or coffee maker all the way up to, to the servers. And they're spreading very rapidly, right? As I mentioned, there's the biggest hyperscale data center, cloud data st uh, storage uh, and processing uh, sites in the world. Uh, they're connected through a network of, of you know, 5G uh, base stations where there's a lot of filtering, a lot of uh, edge computation that's happening. And at the other extreme, are, you know, we're on a path to a trillion connected devices, which are all these wearables, all of these sensors, uh, your laptops, your smartphones, your car, all of these things are generating data, consuming data, sharing data, processing data, and it's just going to continue to grow with billions and billions of processors being shipped every year. So, okay, they're everywhere, but what do they do? Well, if you wanna process anything, you take some input, you, you, you perform some operations on it, you maybe get some additional information from, from your memory or storage, and you generate some output, you feed that back and you repeat that. Well, that's what a processor does or what a CPU does. It takes input from a keyboard, a mouse, has uh, some, some uh, processing functionality, some control functionality, some memory and some output, and it basically repeats that. So a microprocessor is just a general purpose computing engine. But you have to tell it what to do, right? You have to write a program, you have to uh, provide it with some instructions for it to carry out its, its job. And those instructions start as a high level program uh, that then gets compiled into what we call assembly language, which is a, a language that's closer to what the specific processor speaks. And then that's converted to a, a set of a, a binary representation that's ultimately uh, what an electrical system uh, can process and use to, to implement the computer and ultimately the program that you're trying to run. So how does a microprocessor execute a program? So if a program is made up of a collection of instructions, what a microprocessor is responsible for doing is fetching each of those instructions from memory, decoding them to figure out what they are, uh, executing them to, to whether it's an add, a subtract, a move, and then either getting data or storing data to and from main memory. So that's basics of what a uh, microprocessor does to process a program. The essential characteristics that make up a microprocessor, I'll kind of group into three key areas. One is what we call architecture. So it's not building architecture, but it's kind of the foundation of, of how the, the microprocessor works. Uh, Microarchitecture, which is not just a small version, not the, a little Eiffel Tower like in Las Vegas, but, but, but it's more of a kind of inner workings, the details, the next level of refinement 
of how that particular building is, is implemented. And then of course, these are all come to life as an integrated circuit or a microchip built out of, uh, of, of what's now billions of, of transistors. So I'm gonna take a dive into each of these areas just quickly to give you a sense of what we mean by architecture, microarchitecture, and uh, uh, microchips. And like I said, architecture in the computer sense is not about buildings. It's really a way to think about is it, it's the interface contract between hardware and software. It's how software and hardware are gonna to work together to get things done. What are the instructions that the hardware supports? What can the software expect when the hardware executes instruction? What happens when something goes wrong or an unexpected event happens like pressing reset or, or a, 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 a faulty memory? So basically architecture is this layer that sits in between hardware and software so that they can work together and understand how, what the expectations are on each side of that interface. So some kind of notable elements just to kind of bring architecture to life and make it a little bit more tangible in some of the today's vernacular. So some notable architectures, ARM and x86 are currently, you know, the predominant architectures of, of the compute world. But, you know, that's not to be said that there aren't a lot of other uh, architecture platforms that either were relevant or are still relevant today. So I've, I've listed some of them. I've kind of uh, try to gray out some of the ones that are kind of maybe becoming less prevalent in the modern world, try to keep some of the ones that are a little bit more uh, notable. Some of them are more uh, uh, niche areas uh, of the processing world, but nonetheless, these are all uh, architectures that either are exist, do exist or have existed. Uh, they can all be categorized as, as generally as RISC or CISC, CISC machines, reduced instruction or complex instruction set computing machines. Uh, most of the processors today tend towards a reduced instruction set paradigm, and most of them in an implementation style actually look more and more like a risk machine underneath the hood, even though their, their base architecture might be uh, complex. The size of the architecture or kind of the, the fundamental element or building block from which this architecture is built out, what gets fetched from memory, what gets processed from memory, generally varies from 64-bit in size down to 4-bit with uh, 64 and 32 being the kind of most prevalent sizes that, that most people will interact with. Although for more embedded mic uh, microcontroller applications that need to be really low cost or really low power, 16 and 8-bit solutions are, are, are still in existence. Over the last 20 years or so, we've moved from a, a world where there was lots and lots of architectures, lots of people competing for, for mind share, a lot of diversity, a lot of proprietary solutions to a world where we've consolidated around a smaller and smaller number of processors, uh, largely because the, the software development community and the effort it takes to deploy, you know, billions, if not millions of, of applications around the world, you know, you get more scale when you can kind of focus on a standard that everybody agrees to. So a couple of hot topics within the architecture space are security and safety. And I won't go into details here, but, but clearly in a world where we have a trillion devices with data, instructions, computer programming is running. It's incredibly important that the architectures of today and tomorrow and the implementations have security as one of their foundational considerations uh, in terms of feature set and our ability to protect the programs and protect your data. Similarly, on the safety side, as we do more human and machine interactions with autonomous driving systems, with um, uh, uh, industrial robotics, uh, the chance for, for, for human injury or for, for systems that are not safe uh, is going to go up. And so it's incredibly important that we bake safety considerations into the way we design the processors, both in terms of the, the hardware functionality, the way software operates, and also the process that we use to make sure that they, they have uh, uh, fewer and fewer defects so as not to cause a problem. If I pivot over to the microarchitecture, like I said, it's not the, the small version of architecture, but it's, it's really the next level down. It's a specific implementation of a microarchitecture. So if you think about, or I'm sorry, a specific implementation of an architecture. So what is it that you want from a performance, from a power consumption, from an area perspective in your microprocessor? How do you want to organize the memory? How do you want to fetch instructions? How do you want to load and store data? How many instructions can you dispatch or, or decode or execute in parallel? So you can take two, two machines that execute the same architecture, 
have the same expectations in terms of compatibility, but you can implement them completely differently to hit different targets. So I'm gonna take a deeper dive into some of the concepts of, of what I mean by, by microarchitecture and the implementations. But before I go into the concepts, let me just kind of paint a slightly different picture. You know, we said that a, a microprocessor has to fetch, uh, decode, process, and store uh, um, uh, instructions. But if you look on the left, right, you can do that in a four-bit four fashion, fairly simplistic, fairly straightforward. Maybe it's very small, low cost, very low power. Or you can do that in a more extreme sense and, and, and run lots of instructions in parallel, have large caches, um, run at gigahertz of frequency, uh, use anywhere from milliwatts to, to tens of watts of, of power. And so you could have two machines that are completely different in terms of their capability, but they both execute the same architecture or the same instruction set. So when I dive down into microarchitecture and talk about some key, key aspects of it, you know, we mentioned that memory is a part of a CPU, but it's really much more sophisticated than that. There's really a hierarchy of memory with the fastest, smallest memory being closest to the processor and closest to the execution elements and various levels of this hierarchy as you go up all the way to level two caches, level three caches, RAM and, and hard disk or solid state storage. So when you're close to the CPU, it's expensive, it's very fast, but you can only have so much of it because it is expensive. As you move away, you can store with more density, the cost is lower, but it's much further away and much harder uh, to get into the processor to do the uh, uh, execution that you're looking to achieve. Um, in advanced systems today, we have multi-levels of caching, different sizes that, that span megabytes of, of on-chip cache, and we actually have prefetching engines or algorithms that try to figure out what data you're going to need next and bring it closer to the processor. So we rely on data that's been used recently, temporally, data that's been used in the neighborhood of other data, spatial data, to try to figure out uh, which data you're going to use next. Another key concept in the microarchitecture is pipelining. So this is just assembly line or, 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 or like an assembly processing. So the really simple example that you'll see in some of the lectures are if you've got to do four loads of laundry, you can wash it, take the first load, wash it, dry it, fold it, start the second load, wash it, dry it, fold it. But you, you're leaving a lot of machine uh, time idle. So you can pipeline this by starting the first load in the washer. When it moves over to the dryer, you start the second load into that into the washer in the first one, and so on, so that all of these tasks are basically pipelined together in a way that lets you complete them in a much uh, faster uh, uh, time frame. So similarly, in a microprocessor, we take the instructions that make up the program, and we break them up into pieces, as we talked about, fetching them, decoding them, getting the operands, executing them, uh, storing back the results. And we break those up into pieces and we run them in overlapping phases within the machine so that it runs faster. We use a clock to sequence each of these events and the frequency of the clock, whether it's megahertz or gigahertz or whatever, is basically the, the basic tick of, of data movement from one stage of the pipeline into the next stage of the pipeline. So some other advanced techniques that we use to make microprocessors run faster. So if one pipeline is good, more pipelines is better. So we have superscalar machines where you can uh, basically put more instructions simultaneously through the machine at the same time. So this would be like having more washers and dryers to run more things in parallel. We also uh, have uh, microprocessors that execute out of order. So if you think about a program that has a sequence of instructions, sometimes a processor stalls on a given instruction. Maybe it's waiting for data that's all the way out on the hard disk that's gotta be brought in and it takes a long time. So instead of just having the processor sit there and wait, it will scan ahead into the program and look for instructions that it can execute out of order without breaking the actual functionality of, of uh, the program's intent. So this doesn't really work with washers and dryers, but it's something we use very successfully, even though it's very complex, uh, it's very common in, in modern high compute performer uh, uh, microprocessors. A couple of other advanced techniques. One is uh, multi-threading or simultaneous multi-threading. So uh, you can think of a process or a set of tasks that have to be done. First, you, you uh, do one set of, of 
activities and they, they consume different parts of the machine as you're executing them. And then you move on to the second phase. In reality, right, computers switch between all of these tasks all the time and they're constantly doing bits of one process and bits of another process. Um, but you still have large portions of the uh, compute engine that's not being fully utilized. So multi-threading is an attempt to basically utilize all of the hardware that you have in the processor uh, in a more efficient manner, which means you basically have different programs in different stages of that pipeline intermingled within the machine at the same time. So you've got uh, one set of instructions in the fetch and decode stage. Another program might be executing in that pipeline or storing data. Another program might yet be fetching in the other pipeline. And yet another program might be uh, executing or storing or accessing memory in, in that pipeline as well. So very, very complicated, very, very difficult to get well or to get right, but also another technique that can be used to uh, speed up execution for processes that are inherently multi-threadable. We also use uh, symmetric multiprocessing, SMP or MP. Basically, this is just multiple processors uh, running underneath an operating system, and the work is just carved up across those different processors. If you're dialed in on a laptop or a computer or a desktop, you definitely have a multiprocessor system that you're working from. If you're dialed in from a phone, a smartphone, you know, typically it's an ARM-based processor and we, we have a, a, um, a technique we call big little where we have some of these processors are really uh, high performance processors for you know, video or gaming or something that takes a lot of compute. And then small implementations of the same processor that, that sip power and can extend your days of use and your battery life. So uh, SMP is a very common technique used in, in pretty much everything, even, smart, uh, even your smartwatch uh, is either has or is trending towards multiprocessing within, within that type of wearable. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but, but I want to just kind of quickly explain or walk you through the process of how a microprocessor becomes an integrated circuit. We talked about the architecture, the, the high level contract of how it works. We talked about the implementation or the microarchitecture. And now what we're talking about is how it becomes an integrated circuit. So it starts from a block diagram, a system definition where microarchitects and performance analysis engineers basically figure out what blocks do I need? How do they perform? How do they hook up? Then logic designers basically code it up in a, in a language that's specifically written for hardware description. So one of the things I always find really cool for, for those that don't work in this industry is we write our computer designs in a computer program that we simulate on a computer to design the next computer to, to, to continue that process. So that basically computer program code uh, represents how the processor works. It's converted into logic gates. It's converted into transistors. It's converted into polygons that represent the actual physical layers on a silicon wafer. Through that whole process, we're using uh, EDA tools from vendors like Synopsys or Cadence or, or Siemens or, or others. And we're basically uh, reducing this through different levels of ab abstraction so that we can um, basically bake it into a silicon wafer and ultimately uh, create a die that we can package and, and sell as a computer chip or a microprocessor. This is a really busy slide and I recognize I'm not gonna read through all this, but I try to take a little bit of a stab at, at some kind of the industry players just to kind of highlight some of the notable names that, that many of us have worked with or worked for. Uh, it's not a complete list by any means, but I was just trying to show, you know, the different places in the value chain where there's IP providers, there's EDA tool providers, there's chip designers, there's people associated with manufacturing, there's OEMs that take these parts and put them together and sell end products. There's clearly a whole software ecosystem that sits behind this. And I, and I try to call out a few examples of different uh, integration schemes that, that various companies throughout this value chain use from kind of almost fully integra integrated from end to end to, to people that pick up different parts of that value chain and, and focus their attention across those different areas. You know, just before I wrap up, I just wanted to kind of bring it all together with a final kind of sense or, or demonstration of how far microprocessors have come in the last 50 years. So the first microprocessor, Intel's 4004, 
um, you know, was a four bit architecture. So basic building blocks and basic data movement was four bits of information. Today's modern processors, like I said, are generally 64 bit processors. You know, that first chip had a little over 2000 transistors and now we're shipping uh, CPUs that are 4 billion per CPU die. And often we package multiple CPU dies into the same substrate or package. So we're, we're clearly in the billions and, and trending towards the tens of billions of uh, devices within a, a, a high end CPU microprocessor. The first uh, four bit architecture CPU was less than a megahertz of operating speed. And now we're running three to four gigahertz typically. Sometimes you can run faster than that, but that's kind of where the sweet spot is for, for most designs today at the high end. Um, what used to take eight clocks to finish an instruction, we're now finishing three or four and sometimes many more instructions every clock cycle. Originally, we had no on-chip memory or cache. Now we have level one, level two, level three caches all on the same die. And we've gone from, you know, from zero to kilobytes to megabytes of memory on the die, and, and they're all faster as well. And like I mentioned with multiprocessing, you know, we used to have one CPU on a chip. Now we have 32, 64, 96. We're trending, we're seeing examples of 128 uh, CPU processors on a single chip. So collectively, all of these advances in architecture, in uh, microarchitecture, in transistor scaling, in, in uh, cleverness about how we design with EDA tools in software. You know, we've gone from a world 50 years ago that was you know, doing the first microprocessors to something now that's millions of times more performant than those first generations. So you know, that's an amazing transition and that's amazing reason why we've got so many processors in our everyday life. So before I hand it over or, or, or pause my section, um, I just thought I'd put a few things up here from a homework perspective. We already talked about estimating the number of microprocessors in your house. Uh, I also suggest you think about your daily life and what you could or couldn't do if you didn't have microprocessors. If you haven't written a program, go online, try, try to write a first program. There's a few videos there that talk to you a little bit more about microprocessors, how they're designed, how they're manufactured. And if all else fails, I suggest you try pipelining your laundry. Just be really careful if you talk to your spouse about the best way that you think laundry should be done. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff Kale. Appreciate it very much. And with that, we're gonna pass it on to Robert Hormuth from AMD. Robert, it's all you. Okay, let me see if I can get the share going. And tell me if it's coming through okay. Yes, it is. Okay, well, I'm gonna just dive right in and I probably won't spend a lot of time on, on me. Um, Robert Hormuth, I've been, uh, I'm a corporate vice president at AMD, responsible for our data center and embedded solutions group uh, architecture and strategy. I am uh, about, a, about a close to a native Texan and central Texan as you can get. If you uh, grew up in a little town of Rockdale, just uh, east, if you go up to Round Rock and take a right, um, you'll, you'll hit one little town with about two lights. Um, I spent my career mostly doing systems architectures. I did start in my career doing ASICs for a while, got involved in a lot of uh, IO subsystem designs, got involved in x86 and ARM embedded designs. Uh, started my career here at National Instruments. Um, you know, worked at, uh, spent some time at Intel and 13 years at Dell and I've been at AMD for about a year now. Um, and I am a, a Longhorn and a, a proud Longhorn and a member of the UT uh, Computer Science Advisory Board. So happy to be here for the, the invite, Jay. So let me just dive in. And, and I think, you know, Bob is probably going to talk some about this, but wanted to kind of preference this with, you know, with what Jeff covered in terms of, you know, microprocessors and the uses and just kind of show where, where are they at? What's kind of the percentage of applications? Where are they at? And this is a you know, from IC insights of, of looking at the, a 2020 snapshot of, of sales. And, and you can see, you know, broken up between, you know, x86, a traditional PC servers, mainframes, you know, embedded microprocessors, the cell phone market is, is growing, you know, wildly. Um, and then, you know, you have your tablets, but it's, you know, it's everywhere from communications to computers and peripherals to, your Bluetooth headsets to, you know, your 
consumer devices to to automotive and other. I mean, I like that. You know, automotive right now is turning uh, you know into a uh, you know a chip with wheels essentially. Um, so it's you know they're they're pervasive everywhere and continuing to grow. And so let me dive in and, and talk a little bit about some of the things that's driving us. And you know, right now, you know, in the world today, it's it's really driven by compute. Um, it's everywhere. It's ever it's it's pervasive. It touches all aspects of our life. It recommends movies. It recommends sometimes way too many things for us. But the appetite for compute, you know, appears to have no bounds. Um, we now have about four billion users. Um, about 21 billion devices, um, you know, projected to produce over 400 exabytes of data per day by 25. Um, you know, and that to, to me actually, and I think, you know, the, the chat window, that kind of seems low of, uh, you know, devices if we uh, add them all up, but maybe it's right. But, um, you know, the, the computational demand is just simply this giant wave crashing in on us. And there's a, a number of things that are driving that. If we look at a couple key trends, you know, the key trend around, you know, connectedness, especially in the last 18 months or two years, um, while we may be far removed from one another, at the same time, we're more connected than ever. Um, you know, there's a huge part of the population that's connected, as I talked about, um, you know, about half the world is connected. Many describe themselves as, you know, online constantly. Um, if you have teenagers, yeah, that's probably a problem. And in you know other parts of the world, like in Africa, you know, mobile phones are more common than access to electricity. Um, and so you know, you, the the smartphones and devices like that. I mean, if you think about it, they're just collections of you know, they're just a sea of collected sensors, collecting all kinds of information, making our lives better, digital assistance, connectedness to our families. Um, but it, it's driving this, you know, this huge growth of data um, that, you know, businesses are trying to figure out what to do with. And, you know, the other key thing on the, the digital, you know, acceleration is, you know, like I said, the pandemic was really just gasoline on an already hot fire. Um, you know, telecommuting was already was already popular, but now it's, you know, required. You know, the fact that we're on Zoom here tonight. Um, distributed workforces have, have gone from, you know, merely convenience to mission critical. Um, the digital acceleration is, you know, it's impacting both the volume and the types of the data generated. And, you know, if you look at telemedicine, I mean, who would have thought telemedicine when it would have been as popular as it is today, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, the, the number of virtual visits due to the pandemic has gone up by 5x. And you can see on the chart here, the amount of Zooms um, you know, jumped up during the, the start of the pandemic and it hasn't stopped and it's continuing. Um, we're on a Zoom tonight. So this whole digital acceleration is just continuing to drive this adoption of digital um, technology and, and microprocessors at the heart of it. Continuing down, you know, another big theme is as we, as we get all this data, you know, a key trend is around, you know, the complexity of the data. We're we have seas of sensors now. If you think about it, we're digitizing the analog world in many ways. And a lot of the old legacy architectures that we had were oriented around human, human decision-making. You know, in, com in, in comes the rise of, of AI and machine learning to help us make automated decisions. And if you look behind, you know, many of your, your probably favorite apps like Netflix, hidden behind the scenes is a big AI engine doing a recommendation engine trying to recommend your next favorite movie because you might know, you know, five different people that liked it and you're connected somewhere in the internet and so they want to recommend it to you. Um, but this, this volume and types of uh, data that fuel machine learning are also driving new approaches to, to data architectures. And, and um, you know, so we have this whole notion of machine learning, analytics, um, real-time data movement, on-premise data movement, these huge data lakes where people are trying to mine and, and make useful business decisions out of this data. And if you think about it, data in general, it has a time intrinsic value. Either you process it and you find something useful and meaningful, or you're going to be too late. Human beings, you know, uh, attention span is not what it used to be. If you want to generate, you know, ads and generate 
eye clicks and eyeballs on the screen, you better be quick on your recommendations because we're not as patient as we, as we used to be. Um, and then if you think about the other thing that all this drives, this whole notion of, of this big compute, you know, the, the, we think about artificial intelligence, machine learning, however you like to think about it, you know, the, the model sizes are growing just exponentially. And the number of parameters in some of these large models are doubling about every two and a half, three months. Um, you know, we need compute to double about every three to four months to keep up. Um, but the underlying al algorithms from, you know, recommendation engines to deep learning to natural speech recognition, natural language processing, all these things, every time you interact with Siri or um, any digital assistant, there is some, you know, there's a lot of computational horsepower behind the scenes. And the, and the, the capabilities to deliver this, this major quality of life, you know, improvements is, is just growing by leaps and bounds on us. And so we're starting to run into some, some tell headwinds that are starting to make it more challenging. And so if we think about the technology headwinds to meet this growing demand, um, I'm going to say we have the slowing of Moore's law. I'm not going to be the millionth person to say it's the death of uh, Moore's law. Far from it. I think we have a lot of tricks in the industry to continue to advance it. Um, some of it at, at at the you know the semiconductor level, some at the system level. Some of it will be with how we you know spin those transistors in the future. But it's definitely slowing, you know. And at the same time, the, the cost is going up. You know, unfortunately, cost is going up at the same time as we continue to shrink. So it is getting harder, which generally means supply and demand, it gets more expensive. Um, but the demand for this computational growth is really outpacing the, the what we used to get with the, you know, progress re realized by Moore's Law. Um, you know, it's now pretty recognized that, you know, conventional computing is, is uh, just approaching some fundamental limits in energy efficiency to keep up with this high demand. Um, it's not that general purpose computing is going away anytime soon, far be it. Um, but the trends show that for, you know, that for general purpose compute, that as we push the envelope towards the edge, it it's, uh, becomes, you know, less and less energy efficient. And so there, you know, there's new approaches that are being required. And I'm, that's where I'm going to pivot next is to what are some of the new approaches that we're turning to for increasing computational efficiency and, and, and capacity. And if you, you know, in the bottom right chart, and, and I think, you know, Jeff showed this chart as well, you know, the transistors are, are still growing. Our, our single threaded performance is flatlining somewhat, still increasing slowly. Um, frequency is pretty flat. Uh, unfortunately, our power is trending up and, uh, you know, the, the cores are, are trending up too. Um, so those are, you know, there's some good things and some bad things in that chart. So if we talk about, you know, moving forward though, you know, first, you know, general purpose compute is gonna to continue to improve. Again, there, the, the death of Moore's law has been way over predicted too many times. And we're finding new innovative ways. It may not just be in silicon. Um, I like to think about it in terms of, you know, silicon and packaging system and software. Um, you know, the, the industry is certainly advancing into Chiplet technologies, you know, AMD was, was, has been a champion of chiplet technology. Um, we're starting to do some 3D chiplet stacking as well. You know, that along with, you know, efficient power optimized designs, um, you know, with all the tricks of the trade, we'll continue to propel that. At the system level, you know, there's, there's other bottlenecks in, the, in computation that come out that aren't just in the CPU. The CPU has to talk to IO devices. It has to talk to storage devices. It has to talk to memory devices. Um, it has to talk across around the world, across the internet to get to you. So there's a lot of system things that we can improve in and around the microprocessor from interconnects, memory, you know, and balancing the system out to, to really eliminate those key performance bottlenecks. And then, you know, probably under, under emphasized here is the software. You know, they co-optimize software to accelerate system capabilities, whether you're, you know, in Java or Python or using AMD's Rockham or C, C++, efficient algorithms are going to be critical to get the most out of these, out of the hardware that we're, that's being invented in the industry and continuing to drive innovation. But 
let's move on to kind of enter the enter this this new new world. A lot of people call it the you know the domain specific you know architectures. You know, and these are you know architectures that you know are are being invented to exploit new computational approaches, and they're really very very optimized you know hardware for specific workloads or problems. Um, and they can deliver very significant improvements for those particular problems. Um, they're not general purpose, um, but they can be very good for very specific problems. And if we look at some of the leading examples right now with the advent of, of smart NICs, which I'll talk about here in a minute, um, graphics pro uh, graphical processing units, AI accelerators and FPGAs um, are all examples of people exploiting DSA to find new ways to improve performance. Um, but there's an important element here with the, the pictures on the bottom. You know, we can't forget about Ms. Mr. Amdahl, you know, Amdahl's law that basically said the serial part of the problem is gonna end up being the limiting factor on your speed up. And it's really kind of like you're too many cooks in the kitchen. You know, you, you can only put so many cooks in that picture and they're not gonna help you speed up. So what do we do as, as humans and how, what can we do with domain specific? We can go invent a new kitchen with some robotic uh, arms in there to uh, get rid of the cooks from the kitchen or reduce the number of cooks in the kitchen and speed up the overall process. So I'm going to go through the, the next couple of slides are, are going to just be some of these, some examples of these domain specific architectures. The first one is what the industry calls a smart NIC. Some call it a DPU, some call it an IPU, um, but it's basically pushing intelligence into your, your networking subsystem to offload, to offload things from your host. So if you're thinking about a server, you know, you have a network interface that is talking to the outside world. Um, that network interface is driving faster and faster line rates, which means it's interrupting the host processor to receive those packets and figure out what to do, or it's having to go talk to storage devices. So we've invented this notion of a smart NIC to where I can push some of that functionality down into, you know, it's basically a server, you know, it's a, a computer and a computer. It's a server and a server. So we have this high speed um, device that replaces your standard traditional NIC, your network adapter. And we put a bunch of processing and offload functions in there so that I can have some programmability on my pipelining, have some high performance cores, I can have a lot of local devices for, for drives or memory or DRAM. And then I and to the host, I can virtualize them or present physical functions to the host. And the net effect is, is you know, I can expose things to the host and I can offload cycles from that, from that server host, whether it be x86 or ARM, but I can offload those, those you know, IO tasks and uh, I can end up saving cost, get better efficiency, get better determinism, get better security, better isolation. So there's a number of, of benefits to, to taking this uh, advantage of this. And if you, if you dive into the details at your favorite cloud provider or your favorite hypervisor provider, if you dive into the details, you'll find out very quickly that they're losing anywhere from, you know, 15 to 25, 15 to, you know, 25% of their um, cores are lost to all these services that are being pushed down on the smart NIC. So by doing that, I am now free to have all that extra capacity to offer for more performance or more instances. Um, and so that's why the, the world is, is fast looking at adopting uh, smart NIC technology. The next domain specific architecture has been around for a while, uh, a graphical processing unit. You know, it's a specialized Processor originally designed to accelerate, you know, graphics rendering, uh, games, um, things of that nature. What we've done in the industry is, is we, we've learned how to use those devices for other functions for like HPC or machine learning. Um, and going even a step further, you know, if you look at the bottom graph, there's actually ways to optimize that into two distinct different domain specific architectures. And what we did at AMD is we, we optimize one for RDNA, for rendering. So that's for your gaming, your pixel devices. And then one called CNDA for your computation. So we actually took a domain specific architecture and broke it in half and actually optimized in two directions. 
because it, there's different optimizations that can be made for the rendering world versus compute intensive. And you know, one, one result here is if you look at the, uh, the ASCII white supercomputer from 2000, you know, that was the number one supercomputer in 2000. It was six megawatts. It weighed you know, 202,000 pounds, produced about 12.3 you know, teraflops of peak performance. Fast forward 20 years of semiconductor innovation. We've now delivered the equivalent of that ASCII white supercomputer in a single AMD instinct, the MI100. It weighs about two and a half pounds and 300 watts and delivers about 11 and a half teraflops. So that just shows you the progress the semiconductor industry has made in terms of advancing the process and advanced architectures to be able to pull that off. Another one that is Widely being, uh, you know, there, there must be, I think I lost track after about 50 startups doing AI accelerator chips. Um, but an AI accelerator is another type of specialized hardware designed to accelerate, you know, AI and machine learning applications. Um, you know, they're optimized for neural networks and machine vision, and, and they're different than general purpose processors. You know, they're, they're, they are in, in many ways very similar. Um, they have many cores, they have high bandwidth needs, um, but they're doing, oftentimes they're doing different kinds of arithmetic, um, different data formats, different precisions, different data flows. Um, you know, I have a picture here of, uh, of the TPU from Google, which was, uh, you know, a design that, that Google um, did years ago that is really specialized, again, another domain-specific architecture, specialized in matrix processing, optimized for, um, for compute density and very high throughput. Um, you know, and so they made all those architectural trade-offs as if you think about whenever you do a Google search, there's probably, you know, a TPU somewhere in the background that had done some machine learning to come up with a training model um, that might be behind uh, some of that search. And then the, the other, the last one to talk about in terms of, you know, domain specific is this, this filled programmable um, gate array or, or FPGA. You know, it's basically, it's a reprogrammable circuit. Um, that the end user or the customer programs. And generally they're programming these in the same kind of languages that you do for an ASIC. It's generally done in a higher level description language um, that one might use for an ASIC, but they're reprogrammable. So it's a sea of gates, a sea of DSPs, a sea of, uh, of logics, a sea of SRAMs that you can load a, a basically a bit stream or a program in it and it will perform that function. And FPGAs are, are really good for, you know, different types of problems, um, you know, irregular and regular, but it, it really depends on, on the problem. But they can be very good, especially on data movement kind of problems. Um, but they can also be used in, you know, that you can they can be customized and used in AI as well. But they're, but it's a whole set of different trade-offs um, be behind these different VSAs. And so I'll, you know, wrap up with, you know, the, about the flexibility in software. So as you look at the spectrum of these kinds of devices, you know, the, the most flexible is the general purpose CPU. You can, you can program it in a high level language or down to a low level assembly language if you want. But as you go to the, you know, if you, as you go from uh, right to left on the top, um, you know, ASICs, once you burn an ASIC in, it, it is what it is. FPGAs are reprogrammable, but take a, a higher level language than most users um, know. And GPUs, again, are programmable, but again, it's not quite as easy to program a GPU as a CPU. But if you look at the efficiency, the, the opposite holds. You know, if you, the most efficient thing we know how to make, if you wanna make a fixed function widget um, that's gonna do the same thing, the best thing we know how to do is turn that, it's, it's gonna be an ASIC, it's gonna end up being your most optimized device. And, and I think I, I added this chart, um, which is a translation from Hennessy and Patterson that uh, they've used many times, which is just to give you an idea of, you know, general purpose, you know, flexible and high efficiency. And this is an area where I think in, in terms of microprocessors moving forward, we need more and more time on software, on programming, not just teaching, teaching languages, but teaching programming. Um, if you just look at this is a great example of uh, taking a, a matrix multiply and comparing what my speed up is if I write it in a high level language by Python 
move it over to C and, uh, you know, to uh, translate it to a static compiled language like C, I get about a 50x improvement over Python. If I take C and I write some code to extract all the parallelism, you know, I get another, you know, I can go up, you know, 400x. If I go a step further and I go with C and loops and I do memory, you know, optimizations, cache line alignments, organization of the memory structures, I get another big jump. And then if I take, you know, a CPU extensions or a, a, a DSA, like a GPU or, a, or a, another type of device, you know, I can get up to 50x, you know, improvement by using these de domain specific, you know, architectures or instruction set extensions. And this is why the, the world is, while the computational demand is, is, out, is, is on fire, you know, we have to look to exploit these other architectures for these very specific problems um, because they can offer, you know, much more efficient solutions at the end of the day. Um, but they're all computational devices, you know, at the end of the day, just in uh, different forms and uh, different forms and purposes. So, Jay, I think that's the, the end of mine. I didn't have a good homework assignment or wrap up, so apologize. No worries. Thank you very much, Robert. That was great and a great follow on to Jeff Kale's presentation. Now we're going to close it with a, a little bit about the market and the, uh, the, the strength and resiliency of the industry, what the demand is, and what some of the challenges are ahead. So for that, we have Bob Sorensen. Bob, thanks a lot and take it away. Great. Who's ever sharing has to, there we go. Cool. Um, let me see if I can screen share here. While you're pulling it up, let me please there remind everybody to uh, join the Slack workspace and the microprocessors-questions channel if you want to submit a question. I see one here in the Q&A, um, whoever that is, mi dot dot dot. Uh, you'll, you'll want to ask that in the Slack workspace. That's where we're reviewing the questions uh, to ask the presenters at the end of the evening. And I will be selecting one of those in consultation with Heather in the background or the South by Southwest badge. So if you've got questions uh, after the first two or during Bob's, please submit in the Austin Forum Slack workspace. Bob, take it away. Great, thanks, uh, Jay, appreciate that. I, I just want to tell everyone that was, that was really, that was a re two really good talks. Uh, it's a complex subject and, and the two previous speakers really hit all the highlights. So I have the disadvantage of going third, which basically I would just say, yeah, what, what they said uh, worked really well for me, but, but I do have to fill my 15 minutes so let me go forward anyway. Um, I, I'm fascinated and thrilled that someone used the, 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 the TJ Watson quote about, there's probably only a place for five computers in the world because we look back at that and kind of chuckle at it. But in retrospect, uh, Mr. Watson was exactly correct um, because he was looking at what a computer was at that time, which was a monster machine. It, it was large. It took up many rooms. It consumed huge amounts of power, and it was built on tube technology, hundreds, if not thousands of tubes that, uh, you know, if you've got 10,000 tubes and each tube has a, a lifetime of 10,000 hours, that means uh, your machine's going to fail every hour. Um, so he was right. There was only about five machines of that type, but he failed to recognize that technology and 70 years of, of creativity and innovation would completely transform the sector. So the idea of millions of computers became realistic and it became pretty obvious. Uh, so there's, there's an awful lot of transition that this sector has had to go through to reach the particular stage as it is now. And, and just to give you a sense of what I think is probably, you know, the, 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 the most simple explanation of what we're talking about here tonight. When you talk about those systems that, that, that Watson was looking at, as I said, they were, they were tube based. Uh, they had little iron cores with wires running through them for memory. And then along came something called, uh, you know, discrete transistors where, you know, instead of building machines out of tubes, you started using little transistors, little devices with three little legs, a base emitter and a collector that you had to wire up to actually build a computer. And so when you saw earlier someone talking about, well, this, this microprocessor has 4 billion transistors. In the old days, they were actually transistors. Each one was about that big. And, um, and then we moved in integrated circuits. And now you started to move maybe 16 or 24 or 1,000 or 100,000 
or a million or a billion of those transistor equivalents onto a single integrated circuit. So the progression of hardware from the, the, the TJ Watson systems of, of 1945 to what we see today has completely transformed the sector and opened up all sorts of new opportunities. Well, in those old days, when you built a, a big mainframe, and we'll go back to say like the 60s or 70s, where you had basically five companies, or actually six companies that built mainframes. Uh, we used to call them IBM and the bunch. It was IBM and then you had the bunch, Burroughs, Univac, CDC, NCR, and Honeywell. And those guys built big machines. And those machines still took up rooms and the processors in them were giant. They were many, many printed circuit boards uh, that, that it took to build one single processor. Uh, if, even if you go back to the early 80s when IBM was building a product line called the 3081, that system had four processors in it. It was a four processor mainframe that cost tens of millions of dollars. Well, the mainframes eventually had their comeuppance when there was something called the, the evolution of mini computers. Companies like DEC and, and Data General started building smaller systems with more compact processors. They were still custom. They were still, in essence, built with logic gates and, and integrated circuits, and each manufacturer built their own processor. But that was the age of the mini computer, and they had their own custom built processors. Well, history evolves, and then we had what we moved to is, is the, the microcomputer, or what, what was then called the microcomputer, which now we call the personal computer. And of course, if you're going to have a microcomputer, what are you going to call the processor in it? You're going to call it a microprocessor. And that's really where the name came from. It was just the evolution of processor technology, moving from large, complex, expensive implementations where you could only have maybe one, two, or four processors in a system, all the way down to what we have today, where you have hundreds, thousands, or in some cases, millions of microprocessors all working on a single computer. So the, the, the trends have always been one of innovation. And, and it was great that we saw all of the ideas in that first talk today about here's a very simple controller. Uh, here's something that does some addition, some multiplication. It can store some memory. It can write some memory. And, and, and all of those things are, are, are absolutely wonderful. But over the years, there have been more and more refinements. You heard about things like pipelining and threads and, and multi-core processors. And all of this amazing technology has built on a hierarchy of new and, and innovative developments in microprocessors. And all of that effort goes forward so we can sit down and check Facebook on our PCs. Um, we didn't, shouldn't be terribly ashamed. But the bottom line to that is, and just before I logged on here, I, I hit my task manager and realized that, yes, I, I may have checked Facebook, but there's also 221 different processes going on right now on my PC that are making things happen, that happen behind the scenes all the time to keep everything up and running and safe and secure and efficient. One, to me, one of the single greatest inventions in all of mankind that we don't look at and we take advantage of is spell check. When I'm sitting there typing a Word document and I type something wrong, it instantly underlines it in red. And if I ask, it gives me a suggestion. So somewhere in the background, this microprocessor of mine is not only checking my email, running virus scans, keeping me informed on, on news and updates, it's also reading every word I type and running a spell check against a known dictionary. And it does that invisibly. And it's little things like that, that the power of the microprocessor has brought to us that we don't really appreciate because all of it happens in the background. So yeah, I'm looking at Facebook, but there's about 220 other things going on in my computer right now that, that require a little bit of resources uh, fr from my, my, my microprocessor. So, uh, that was a really long-winded introduction. Uh, my name is Bob Sarnson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Research uh, at a company called uh, Hyperion Research. We're a small uh, consulting firm with a real emphasis in advanced computing. So our mindset tends to be the highest end of compute capability. We look at things like kind of the HPCs that cost hundreds of millions of dollars that go into you know, national governments to do nuclear weapons research or advanced scientific computing. Uh, we look at things like what's going on in say, uh, the big data world, uh, machine learning, uh, the AI, some of the stuff you've heard before, and also some of the other bright, shiny objects in advanced computing, like neurocomputing and quantum computing. So we come to this more from kind of the advanced end of computing, as opposed to what you've been hearing a lot of today, which is the overall general 
uh, sense of what's going on in microprocessors and the wide range of applications they have, all the way from, you know, right now the, the, the fastest computer in the world, it's, it's installed at a research facility in Japan called Riken. Uh, it took about four, actually it took about eight years to design and it cost $1.1 billion. Uh, it can do about 10 to the, what we call it, about half of 10 to the 17th floating point operations per second. We would call that about a half an exaflop of computation capability. It's, it is the pinnacle of advanced computer design right now. Um, and as I said, $1.1 billion, uh, you know, a triumph of, of technology development based on ARM processors and some of the flexibility that ARM brings. The vendor for that particular system, Fujitsu, basically took the ARM architecture and specifically designed it to meet the complex workloads of that Fugaku system. Uh, so, so we tend to look at some of the more uh, important systems because that's where some of the leading edge technology comes from. But ultimately, a lot of this stuff is built on the same fundamental technologies that are available in the, the smartphone that I turned off and laid on my desk back here before so it wouldn't go off when I was talking. The technology right now runs the gamut from you know, very inexpensive consumer devices all the way up to some of the most advanced computers in the world. So I, unfortunately, um, I, I was probably in a bad mood when I, when I outlined what I wanted to talk about because what I really wanted to do was kind of bring up some of the risks and perils that are facing the semiconductor world right now, especially in the microprocessor sector, because of the way the sector is instructed. Uh, so the, the spoiler alert though is I did promise good news as well as bad news. So I'm gonna start off with a couple of, of, of bad news stories that'll hopefully get people thinking about really microprocessors. If there's one thing we learned from COVID in the last year and a half, it's that supply chains matter much more than we ever thought they did. And, and the supply chain of semiconductors, for a lot of people, I think they don't really pay attention to the fact that it's not as assured, it's not as stable, and it's not as robust as it should be. So I just want to couple, touch on a couple of instances of where we see a certain amount of concern when it comes to the supply chain for the advanced microprocessors that we've been hearing so much about. Well, this chart here, which I, I, I borrowed from a friend of mine uh, at the Eurasia Group, literally talks about what's happening in terms of the number of semiconductor suppliers that are out there in the world. Now, we'll talk a little bit later about what a process node is, and that, that's measured in something called nanometers, 10 to the minus ninth meters. But if you just really attach a time scale here, that 180 nanometers really goes back to about 1999, and the, the three and the five there on the far right really go about today. So you're looking at about 22 years of semiconductor production capabilities from around the world. And if you see in, in 1999, there were 94 different individual makers of semiconductor devices that you could find around the world. There were 24 in the US. We had a whole bunch in China. Uh, Japan was, was turning out a number of, uh, of processors, turning out a number of semiconductors based on their manufacturing facilities. But as process nodes move down, and as I said, we'll talk about that a little later, but what that means is as the process to build these components became more sophisticated, the number of companies that were either willing to commit or could to, uh, commit technically to building next generation chips started to decline. And there's two real interesting points that I wanna draw out here. The first one is that as you can see, the numbers have always gone down, uh, which means that once a company and in some cases, a country withdraws from building semiconductors, it's not easy to get back in. This is something where you always have to be smart in your current generation to be able to build on the next generation. So if you were uh, an organization, say in Japan, and in uh, three years ago, five, four or five years ago, you got out at the 16 nanometer node level, jumping back in the five is something that would be exceedingly difficult and there's literally no precedent for it. So the concern here is not only that the number of semiconductor makers in the world are now declining significantly, but the potential for those manufacturers or any new manufacturers to get back in the game is very, very bleak. Uh, so we're here now and we're, we're kind of at this 10, seven nanometer node for the most advanced semiconductors that are out there today. People are starting to look at what it, takes to make three, uh, excuse me, five and three nanometer chips. Those are the next most important nodes that the sector is looking at. This is the kind of production that the most advanced chips 
uh, are, are manufactured on. And it used to be that these are where the most advanced ships would go into the most advanced IT products. But as we'll see in a minute, that isn't the case anymore. But the bottom line here is that there are three manufacturers, TSMC of Taiwan, Samsung in South Korea, and Intel in the United States are basically the only three major semiconductor vendors who are actively exploring the potential for five and three uh, nanometer uh, process nodes going forward. That's a supply chain vulnerability. Really what this does is it leaves the sector with fewer and more concentrated suppliers. And this graphic on the left, you know, basically what we see is how Taiwan is, is fundamentally controlling a significant portion of the supply of contract manufacturers. Now, I just wanna make a point here that in the old days, and in the before times, if you will, when you were making, when you were making a, say, a microprocessor uh, or even a computer system, you often had your own in-house semiconductor production capabilities. You not only designed the chip, but you built the chip. And in many cases, the chip you built were used in the products that you sold. A good example would be a company like IBM, where they actually built not only memory, but, but logic chips, processors and such that they would put into their own systems and then sell them. IBM got out of that business a few years ago and that created a company called Global Foundries, which leads us to this concept of what a foundry is. Nowadays, the preponderance of semiconductors are manufactured by companies that don't actually design them. They take designs from other companies and then manufacture them for those companies. So what you have now is the bifurcation of the sector. You have companies that either want chips or does, um, and they may turn them over to what we call a waferless fab facility, i.e. folks that design chips who then send it to TSMC or other of these silicon foundries um, or companies that basically just design for hire. If I'm a computer maker or a smartphone maker and I want a specific, a specific kind of chip, I basically go to a, a, a waferless fab, say, please design this for me. They ship it to TSMC, they ship it to um, um, uh, Samsung, or they ship it more in the future to Intel, and then the chip comes back being produced. So there has been a concentration of only a small number of makers of, 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 of um, semiconductors, but hundreds and hundreds of different facilities that design the chips they want that then they then turn over to these, 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 these uh, silicon foundries. And as you can see, there's a small number of them. The market share is really concentrated in Taiwan and, 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 and um, South Korea with Samsung. You have uh, SMIC in China, the semiconductor manufacturing uh, something of, of China. Um, that's, a, that's another player in the game, not as advanced as some of the uh, as TSMC, US, UMC, and Samsung, and certainly nowhere near the process node capability, that three to five level or even seven to 10 that I, I talked about earlier. But if you look at the chart on the right, you can see that you know, there are some lion's share numbers here with TSMC and Samsung. Uh, these, these are the largest money makers. They're, they're largely responsible for where most of the semiconductors in the world are made. And in some sense, they are making some kind of de facto control decisions when it comes to how semiconductor process technology advances. And in some cases, who gets to the front of the line when it comes to access to some of their advanced output? Because they are generally running at full capacity all the time. Their most advanced process nodes are booked sometimes years in advance, which means that they have to make some very hard decisions about who gets to the front of the line. And sometimes those decisions can be made for very obvious business reasons, which means who's going to pay us the most money, who's going to have the most volume, who's going to give us the most long-term contracts, meaning that it's not a fair and equal access to the kinds of advanced semiconductors, particularly microprocessors. You may have a great design, but if you don't have the kind of market penetration, of backup, um, or, 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 or demand uh, that, that allows you to compete with some of the other organizations vying for the attention of these silicon foundries, you could be left hanging and not being able to have the, the, the parts you want manufactured by the company or at the process node that you really need. Um, so this, this rapidly declining uh, participation in semiconductor manufacturing, why the exodus? Uh, I said here cost is a good place to start, but in some sense, cost is really the only place to start. Uh, about a couple of months ago, Intel revealed that they would be making a brand new fab campus. 
And they're estimating it's going to cost between 60 and $120 billion to set that up. Now, ultimately, there was, that's divided up because they're going to be using about six to eight different production modules because they have a number of different production lines that they want to that they want to build for different kinds of components using different process technologies. So each fabrication facility really is only going to cost between 10 and 15 billion dollars a piece. Uh, the picture on the right here, just just for sake of comparison, uh, on the top you see the what an inside of a, a typical high-end fab facility looks like. On the bottom is uh, the John F. Kennedy, uh, one of the U.S. Navy's uh, largest and most recent aircraft carriers. It's about 85% uh, done with completion. Uh, just from a matter of perspective, that's that's probably going to come in at about 11.4 billion dollars. So uh, a typical semiconductor wave uh, fabric fabrication facility right now, it costs you a, a, about a, a good aircraft carrier. Um, so these things are not cheap. Uh, and ultimately, this this process that Intel is is standing up right right now, complicated. Uh, I mean, the 15, the 10 to 15 dollar price, 15 billion dollar price tag, implies a lot of complexity, a lot of skill, a lot of expensive equipment and materials uh, that don't go together very well uh, and very easily. So it may take three to four years for this facility to actually stand up and start turning out product. Um, well, I talked about the three and five node um, uh, process nodes. Well, well, really, what about the not so leading edge? What about those folks that at the seven, the 10, the 14, the 20 nanometer knows. Well, is there any, is there any opportunities there? And, and here we'll talk about something that's really affecting all of us right now, uh, which is going on with the semiconductor shortage in the automotive sector, uh, because those cars don't use the most advanced processors. They tend to use things called microcontrollers or microprocessors. They're not requiring the kind of screaming performance that you'd want uh, you know, to, to, to play a, a really great video game uh, on, on your laptop. Um, so, so they have a, a much less demanding process node. Well, the bottom line there is that still costs about $4 billion to set up uh, to make the kind of chips that car makers typically use. And here, the thing that I think people don't really understand uh, is, is, is really it takes about two years to construct a facility like this, even though it's not at an advanced process node. Um, it, it still takes about two years. And once you get the factory up and running, uh, we, it's called yield. Uh, basically, what it means is you'll be running chips, chips through the process, and manufacturing a chip in one of these in the, one of these processors facilities. The process can take as much as three months from the time you start out with a single silicon wafer to when you actually get uh, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of chips off that wafer when you're done. Um, you may, at the beginning, only have about half of those chips that actually work. A 50% yield is actually pretty not too bad within your first year. And, and people talk about the yield curve where you become, uh, manufacturers become obsessed with driving the yield curve higher and higher. Because basically a wafer start costs, you have to run that entire wafer through a three month process. And only when you've run it through the process, can you test the wafers practically? Can you test the wafers to make sure they work or, or not? So the cost is fixed. So if you get a 1% yield, a 50% yield, or a 99% yield, the cost is fixed. It's just that 1% and 50% yield doesn't pay the bills. So it may take another two to three years before your yield rises to say 90% where you start hitting profitability. So when people say, well, why aren't we getting more chips for the automotive sector? Why is there a shortage? Well, the problem is there's more manufacturers are demanding chips uh, right now than they ever have before for a lot of reasons from the COVID uh, issue, people, people shifting the way they work, their buying patterns and such. But the other thing is the car makers basically got off, uh, they got out of line. Uh, so they stopped ordering components, which meant that now when they want to revamp, they're at the back of the line and people are saying, well, just let's just start making more, more chips again. Well, the answer is the, 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 the flexibility, the elasticity of standing up a facility to, to refill this critical supply chain for the automotive sector and some of the other electronics that we're seeing shortage of, that could take another three to four or five years to actually happen. And that the bottom line there from an investment standpoint is you're basically telling investors, oh, by the way, you have to commit to a lagging technology. This is way behind state of the art. Oh, and the annual growth rate's only about three to 6% uh, for this particular kind of technology right now. It's not an attractive uh, option, which means that even at, even at the, 
basically the not so leading edge in semiconductor production. We're still having problems here in ensuring that it's the supply chain uh, kind of flows the way it does. So I, I mentioned that issue before about we have more and more customers needing more chips from less and less suppliers. And here's, I think, an interesting example. Where someone asked the question earlier about the, the M1 and M2 chips for the Max products, which, by the way, is an absolutely killer microprocessor. I'm, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Apple products, but man, this microprocessor is, has, is, is a really smart, clever design. And, and, and um, I think it, 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 it definitely shows how companies like Apple, when they really put their minds to doing some interesting processor design, they can, they, can, they can really achieve something interesting. Well, here we have TSMC. Remember, these are the, these are the lion's share providers of, of, of foundry-based microprocessors. Um, they have about a $70 billion revenue stream in 2021 estimated. And this is basically what their customer share is by revenue, not by chips, by revenue. A quarter of their output goes to Apple, and it's going for things like iPhones, iPads, and watches, and the ARM-based M1, M2 chips. The next largest one at a little under 10% is AMD. That's where you're going to see um, your, your Zen Core processors for AMD. And then basically you get to smartphone processors for companies like MediaTek, Broadcom, and Qualcomm. Um, and, and then you see NVIDIA is actually turned to um, TSMC for some of their components. And uh, excuse me, Intel has, and NVIDIA. Uh, people like to think of NVIDIA as a GPU maker. They're a GPU designer. Uh, they don't manufacture their own components. Uh, they turn to companies like TSMC to do that. They have a wonderful relationship with TSMC uh, because they spend a lot of money there, but they also work with TSMC very closely to make sure that the processes and the technologies that NVIDIA wants in its chips, TSMC can manufacture. But the takeaway from this chart is that the most advanced semiconductors that the most advanced silicon foundry offers is not going into the most advanced computing project, uh, the most advanced computing products. We're seeing things going into smartphones. We're seeing things going into to laptops and Apple watches. Uh, the, the GPU stuff is, is advanced. Uh, what we see from AMD and, and Intel are advanced, but the bottom line here is that we're seeing less accessibility by what we would consider to be the advanced computing sector here. And it's going towards a much broader base of technology. Jay, did you have something to jump in there or did you just appear out of nowhere? You're muted. I was just letting you know we're, we're, we're a bit over time. So I wanna make sure that you're pick getting close to wrap so we can get a few questions in because I have right. to pick at least one to give a self by badge to. Okay, great, I will speed up. Um, so I, I just wanted to promise a little bit about what all this node stuff is when I talked about the 180 nanometers and such. The bottom line here is, where, and, and this is this is the most, primitive graphic of how you actually add a layer of a layer of design to a, uh, an integrated circuit. And integrated circuits are literally about 40 to 45 different layers of metal and interconnected insulators uh, and conductors to, to make a, a circuit. And what you have on this, you know, uh, th this exposure section, it's basically a stencil. And you shine a light through the stencil and it exposes, it creates a shadow on the wafer and that exposure to the light creates the opportunity to add some fluids that'll either erode away things that have been exposed to the light or erode, erode away things that haven't been exposed to the light. And that's how you build up layers. It's a, it's a relatively complex chemical uh, process, but ultimately the, the, the key point of what's going on at the node level here is how thin a line can you draw so you can actually start to make those little lines on the transistors on the chips, on the wafers. And that is, a, is called lithography. And that is another key point here in terms of how thin a line you can make and why we talk about those process nodes in terms of nanometers, because that's how we measure how thin those lines are. As I said earlier, the current state of the art is about five nanometers. That's 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus nine meters. And just to give that a little sake of comparison, one meter compared to say seven nanometers, uh, is equivalent uh, to the distance to the moon compared with about 79 inches. So we're really talking about a nanometer ring, a very fine line. Drawing such fine lines in a consistent, fast, and reliable manner requires some sophisticated equipment. And this is probably one of the world's most leading edge uh, ASML, um, EUV, uh, uh, lithographic steppers, the things that just projects the light and draws down the, uh, the stencil there that creates the shadow. 
They don't use light anymore because it's too blurry at those lengths. So they use something called extreme ultraviolet, ultraviolet wavelengths. This is a really great system. Um, and this is what is driving three and, oh, excuse me, five and three nanometer processes. And there is only one supplier in the world of these kinds of steppers, and that is ASML for these kind of deep EUV uh, steppers. Uh, the machine has about 100,000 parts, costs about $120 million, and there's a two year back order on those systems. So again, when people talk about supply chain, can we ramp up semiconductor production? Well, here's a choke point that you just can't deny. Even if you order uh, a, uh, an EUV machine from ASML today, you're waiting at least two years to actually stand up, to actually get the machine delivered, and then you have to have the process of starting it all up. ASML is looking for next generation technology because this EUV kind of peters out at three nanometers and below, and they're looking at something that goes below that and right now, there's really nothing promising in the research phase below three nanometers. And people are getting somewhat concerned about what happens next. We talked a little bit earlier today about the end of Moore's law. Well, the idea here is that the Moore's law, if anything's going to end here, it's the ability to move down initial process nodes. Um, so really what we talk about is this is have implications in three dimensions. There's really a single link in the semiconductor uh, supply chain right now, ASML. The potential for wrapping up production at most advanced nodes is severely constrained because they can't build more machines that much terribly faster and progress down the, th the node curve. Sub three nanometers, not as short. Well, enough of that. So I know Jay's gonna pop up again on my screen and tell me to shut up. So let's just close with some good news. Designers of HPC and other leading edge systems, and that includes the smartphone guys and such, they're aware of these issues and they're looking at new ways to really design around this. Uh, chip hardware advances, IBM is still designing new chip designs and turning them over to the foundry saying, here's a way to get better uh, performance out of existing five and three nanometer capabilities. We're using chiplets now. The idea of instead of building a single microprocessor, you build little sections of it so you can mix and match what you need. Uh, processor designs that only that call for the advanced nodes are, 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 are switching in such a way that, okay, say I need five nanometer lines for specific functions in my processor. But over here, I only need 10 nanometer or 20 or 30 nanometer. So only isolate the things where it really matters. Get that little portion of the chip and use much less progressive nodes, uh, uh, process nodes for the other parts of the chip. So there's lots of ways around this. And it speaks more to facing the reality of where the sector is going from a production standpoint. And that ultimately, innovation prevails or as, as you know, um, Jeff Goldberg said in um, Jurassic Park, you know, life finds a way, so do engineers. Um, I, I like this, this chart here because this is the performance of the top 500 most powerful HPCs in the world. And I won't go into any details about the fact that, you know, the, the, the left side is every, every line is an order of magnitude performance. So going back the last 25 plus years, we've, we've gone through, you know, seven or eight or nine orders of magnitude and performance. And each time there has been a new challenge that had to be overcome. And we've heard a little bit about it today. The idea of frequency caps you used to buy a 25 megahertz microprocessor. And now you buy 2.5 gigahertz. Performance gains came from running chip, uh, those processors faster. We've kind of capped out there. Power caps. Now in the old days, you, if you had a 25 or 30 watt processor, that was hot and heavy. Nowadays, three or 300 watt power. That's about as high as we're gonna get in the future. That's another um, limitation. That's another limitation that we've overcome by introducing things like we heard a little bit about threads, the idea of being able to juggle maybe 28, 24, 32, 64, 128 different threads to always keep the processor busy, always keep the job going. Adding more cores to a system has been another way to, to, to overcome for the, the engineers to find a way to deliver performance every time they face a new barrier. And so we always talk about it's time for the end of the end of Moore's law going forward. Um, and, 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 and so even though I've created this, this incredibly um, uh, depressing scenario here in terms of semiconductor processing nodes, the idea is that innovation tends to prevail and that, that there's a whole bunch of really smart designers, engineers, and scientists out there looking to find another way to, to basically beat this particular, if not pernicious, but at least um, hopefully uh, manageable uh, next theoretical threshold that we're all facing. So that I just I just want to um, just just end with that and, and wrap up and just 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 thank Jay for inviting me and allowing me to to kind of talk to this this august group of uh, of folks. 
Thanks, Bob. Uh, if all the presenters could come online again, and Bob, if you could stop, there you go. Okay. Um, we have blown through all of our Q&A time. However, many of the questions were answered in the great content that you saw. So I kept marking questions that I was going to ask and then speakers would, would answer them. So uh, that's a really good sign that the content really addressed a lot of your interests. Um, it's 7.43, Heather and I will dispense with our final slides. I am gonna ask um, people to, to give us five extra minutes so we go till 7.50 and still set instead of 745. So we have time to ask just a few questions. And then I'll ask our presenters if they're uh, afterwards, if they're willing to maybe address some of them in the Slack workspace later this week or some other time. So uh, we have a lot of questions. It's like a lot of really good questions. Thank you all. At one point, there were just a few. I thought, wow, we're gonna have a lot of question and answer time and not many questions. Now we have no time. Lots of questions. Real, so real quickly, I'll ask a few quick ones, uh, answer a few quick ones. Jeff Pape, when and where are the video replays posted? They'll be posted on our website later this week. Um, let's see, what else is a nice, good, quick one? Um, uh, there was a, a great one from Jeff Huxel on what factors do the panelists think are the most important vectors for microprocessor improvements over the next decade or so? Bob sort of hinted at that, but he talked about some of the caps. But real quickly, what do each of you think are the most promising vectors for continuing the performance gains that we've seen over the last few decades? Robert, start with you. I'm going to go with, um, I, I think the, the, the packaging. I think, uh, you know, chiplets, 3D packaging um, are going to be going to be critical to PC systems together. Jeff? Yeah, I mean, I think at the highest end, Robert's right, right? Uh, how we put things together and figure out how to put more transistors into a package and get more, more performance is going to be a big deal. But I mean, the reality is, you know, within my team, we work across all of those functions. And, and the only re way we're going to keep pushing the boundaries is to keep fine optimizations across every one of those layers. Yep. Bob. I think uh, targeting workload, uh, specific workload requirements, no, moving away from a general purpose CPU that does it all, yep. but no, I, I want an AI centric CPU. I, I want a CPU that, that's really built for big data. I, don't, I want one that, that, that lives and dies for compute intensive, one that lives and dies for data intensive, uh, one that looks at you know, matrix multiplication. I, I think we're gonna enter an age of specialization in a, in a much more clever way by the use of chiplets and, and architecting uh, processors to meet specific workloads as opposed to trying to be all things to all people. All right, next quick question. Lenore Mac McMacken asked, does anyone think optical computing technology will ever go mainstream? How about quantum? Reverse order, Bob. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm a huge fan of quantum. Um, I, I saw a t-shirt the other day that said, uh, there's only a place for five quantum computers in the world. And, and the, the, the same thing exactly applies. Quantum is, is difficult, it's unwieldy. It is absolutely mind blowing from a phenomena, but I, I see a day when we will think of quantum computing as an accelerator, just like we think of GPUs. It's another black box in the basement that the compiler directs a workload to that, that gives me unbelievable performance at some level uh, for some, some key applications. It's not the end all be all. It's not gonna replace classical computing, but it's gonna be one heck of an accelerator for some key workloads. Uh, optical computing has been the, 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 the technology of the future for the last 45 years. And I, I firmly yeah. believe it will be the, the, the technology of the future for the next 45 years as well. Jeff. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I guess all I'll say is I think quantum computing is one of your upcoming topics, right? So uh, I would just defer you know, that, to the, that to those experts. Any thoughts on optical? Uh, no, again, probably outside of my area of expertise, I think Bob probably gave it the, the best answer I could possibly give. Robert. I, I, I kind of agree with Bob. I, I think, you know, quantum is interesting. I am wearing a shirt from, uh, from CERN. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's interesting, but I don't know when, you know, to me that that's another form of, uh, domain specific architectures for a very specific problem. That'll be really good if we can never figure it out. On the optical front, I do think the industry, again, it falls in the bucket of advanced packaging, but um, you know, as our speeds continue and continue to grow, 
the laws of physics are fighting us to get off the package and co-package optics is, you know, is starting to happen now. That's far different than optical computing. I'm much more a fan of a co-package optics than a optical computing at this stage. Got it. All right. So uh, this one might be more for uh, just Bob. Uh, John Cobb asked a great question. Bob, regarding the shrinking number of fabs, these firms have international footprints, right? I mean, TSMC has fabs in Taiwan, PRC in US, or Samsung has fabs in South Korea and US, et cetera. Do we really only have three countries left? And is the barrier to entry by country or firm? Could TSE stand up a three nanometer fab in Arizona? Yeah, the point is, you know, as I said, it, I said to somebody at some point, it's, it's not like you order a three nanometer fab facility and, and, and um, you know, it get, it get, Amazon drops it off. Amazon Prime drops it off in Arizona and all of a sudden you're up and running. I, I, I can't wait to see how difficult it is to transfer that, that kind of technology until they get actual real yields. And, you know, the bottom line is, yes, there's, there is a certain amount of diversity, but there are centers of gravity when it comes to things like innovation. You have to build an infrastructure uh, around a fab facility to, to, to make it work. It's, it's, it's why Austin was a center. It's why Silicon Valley is a center. You, ha you, you can't, you develop these advanced technologies in the background. And of course, we can't ignore the, the political overtones of what's going on here uh, in terms of Samsung needing to perhaps move off of Taiwan. But again, I think the technical challenges there are, are gonna be somewhat not insignificant when it comes to doing that. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really about where the companies are, are putting what we like to call their holies. What, what are the most, you know, Intel has semiconductor capabilities in China, but it's not their most advanced product lines for a number of reasons. Uh, it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's not that everyone has their most advanced process nodes in every location. Uh, there's, a, there's a pick and choose issue here as well going on. So I, I tend right. to think of it as country centric. Now with that, it is time for the winning question. And since we have talked about these uh, microprocessors being everywhere, I have selected one question that brings up a concern about that. And that is from Luz Angeles. And Luz, I was gonna to try to promote you to panelists to see if you wanted to ask your security question live as the winner of the South by badge. Um, Heather, can you, there we go. Luz, that was a great question, or Luz, do, a great question. Do you wanna ask that live of the panelists? You're on mute right now. There you go. And apologies, I did have to leave and read on momentarily, but I try to do it as fast as possible. Appreciate you highlighting that question because we did touch on it momentarily, which I really appreciated, which is the security aspect, right? Would love to hear more thoughts, not only from the origination of how we make a lot of these hardware. Luz, your, your audio is coming through just a little bit garbled. Uh -oh. Is this any better? That's better, yes. Uh, yeah, it, it is a great story for figuring out how are we finding ways to secure not only the origination points, right? How we can capture and design different time points, but also more considerably from the supply. No, nope, it's loose. It's still not coming through very well. I'm going to ask it for you, okay? You so, still win the badge. We don't penalize <laughs> for mic quality, even 18 months into a pandemic. <laughs> but but, but uh, Luz's question was, can we clarify how this hardware, chips, et cetera, is being secured, both from design, but also from the supply chain perspective? How do we guarantee a tamper-proof or immutable approach? Yeah, I mean, I, I can jump in on a couple of yeah, things. Please, please. So one of the things that, that ARM does, not in our general processor portfolio, but in a very specialized section of our processor portfolio, is we actually have a, a secure core processor line. And it's actually designed in a clean room with secure locations, with data that's isolated. So the, the entire team has to be vetted, has to be isolated, the compute servers that they design on. And there's basically a, it's almost like a, the way, you know, kind of evidence is kind of handed over in a, in a trial where, where the, the designed uh, content is passed over to each of the different uh, um, people in the supply chain to kind of bring it to fruition. Now, that's we don't do that for 99% for of what we build. 
Um, and I don't think we're going to head in that kind of direction, at least from a development perspective. But what we are doing uh, prevalently is around architecture space where we're putting, uh, you know, we already have various permission levels for, for how code can execute. We're uh, putting in new things like pointer authentication or memory tagging. Uh, there was, you know, if you've heard about the Spectre and Meltdown uh, uh, side channel attacks that were brought to brought to light uh, a couple of years ago, you know, those are ways that that uh, people can observe what's going on inside the computer. Places in, that we thought were more immune to to uh, security violations. So um, it is a area of focus. There is a lot of constructs and a lot of research happening in the processor design space. Um, and, and that's just something we're going to con continue to work on. And we have, you know, a lot of bright people working on it. We have a lot of people trying to break it and come up with new techniques. Uh, and, and actually, you know, our, our next generation architectures at ARM specifically have big ticket security features built into them. And I know x86 has some of the same concepts as well. So at least from a hardware software execution perspective, this is a huge area of focus. Robert, you want to complement that with things about for manufacturing and supply chain? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're you know, I think Jeff hit a lot of the, the high points. Um, you know, we're putting in a lot of security into the design, secure encrypted, you know, virtualization, secure encrypted memory, um, you know, you know, trust, you know, um, ways to authenticate and make sure the, uh, the, the software running is trusted and authenticated. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't think I want to comment on some of the supply chain aspects, but um, I think the industry is the good thing. I think about the industry in this secure space is there's good sharing um, amongst CP manufacturers and the security um, folks around the world that are all wanting to make sure that we have secure devices. And so there's good collaboration across the industry, um, you know, to to make sure that uh, yep. you know threats and attacks and stuff are um, are handled and that we design collaboratively to make sure that the, as an industry, we need all processors to be secure. Bob, I wanna give you the last word on this and then we'll close it out. Um, Robert and Jeff have focused mostly on ensuring the processors can execute trustworthy, secure code. Do you have anything to add maybe on how we get from these small number of fabs and what goes on in those fabs to guarantee security, perhaps even in the code that they're given to start the etching, but also in the handling of those microprocessors as they're then delivered to systems makers. How, how, how is security ensured there? I, I, it's a tough question because you know, the minute you start to build fences, you're announcing to everyone, you, it, it, there's a good reason to climb this fence. Um, I, I often feel like, you know, in some sense, the, the absolute best way to have, you know, any kind of security is to have the absolute most robust, dynamic commercial capabilities, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, commercial capabilities where, where innovation is, is coming out. People are just moving forward. This, this idea of, as I said, building walls, it, 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 it doesn't generally work as well as, as I think it as, as people think it does, because it's just so hard. There's, there's always places, there's always, you can never be sure that what you're doing is, is what you do is, is secure enough. And it has to be open and it has to be robust and it has to be dynamic. So everybody gets to look at it. Everybody gets to play and everybody gets to innovate their own solutions. Um, I've, I've, I've often found that the minute something becomes pushed behind a fence and now there's, you know, you have to, you have to use a badge to get in the building and everything, you lose a lot there. Because, because you're no longer part of the dynamic, innovative, collaborative, global space in terms of progress. Uh, it, it's, it's much more of a closed environment, which means that the odds of you of, of getting the exact right solution, the right implementations are, are small because it's you now versus the rest of the world. And so to me, you just, you just gotta let it all go and, and, and just live in a trust, <laughs> trust nothing environment, but let everybody play at the same time. So Speaking as someone who works at Dell and has to deliver systems to the U.S. government, I'm not sure they would all agree with Bob's uh, uh, position on that right there. I think they would be happy to be part of those open environments, but to make sure that their supply chain is guaranteed on the ones being delivered to uh, that. So, so it becomes very expensive to have a short supply chain. That it are, absolutely that are, does. Where, you know, everybody is a, is a corn-fed Iowan. 
you know, they're per it's perfectly safe U.S. citizens, you know, it's uh, with, with all the polys and all the other stuff. That's a, that's a hard thing, an expensive thing to do. And immediately you're at a competitive disadvantage. There are, other ways to, there are other ways to do it with technology, policy, uh, double blind checks, et cetera. But we are out of time. So 